book, What to Do After You Turn Off the TV. That is the first time that anyone's ever mentioned that book. And if you wonder what it has to do with the rest of my books, it's very clear to me. We uh, give away our power if we spend too much time in front of the television. So I wrote this book with my children, and uh, they illustrated it as well. It is a very political book. It's all about family activities that you don't need a television for. Um, I will um, take, I will be bold to uh, circulate. Um, this is for you if you would like to receive our quarterly e-letter from Anna and me from the Small Planet Institute. Um, and please sign. And there are also a few bookmarks here that summarize the message of my speech in six words. <laughs> so please circulate that and no pressure and we don't deluge you. We can always, you can always unsubscribe. So um, I shall begin. First, let me just say my daughter Anna took this photograph and uh, so she's with us here. And uh, I was just describing the moment this was taken. She had planned to do a perspective shot across and she went click, click, click. We had not seen another human being on this long hike down the mountain in India. And this is the very low beginning of the Himalaya. We hadn't seen another person. And then she went click, click, click. The third click, this woman comes around and uh, she got this picture. And what it meant to us is uh, the symbol for us was, hey, don't forget the women. We do the work. We're carrying the load. So um, this became, after we traveled the world together to write Hope's Edge, which in German is Hoffenstrader, something like that. Um, and uh, so this became, we met people who were facing the greatest obstacles on our planet, and yet they were the most filled with hope. And we said, oh, what did we learn from this? Hope is what we become in action together. And so um, this became the slogan of our organization. So with that, I shall begin. Um, and please, if I begin, I get very excited. So I tend to talk fast. Please be bold and raise your hand if I'm speaking too quickly. And I will try to slow down, but you can always raise your hand again if I get out of control. So um, I began, actually I wasn't, I was 27 when Diet for Small Planet came out. And uh, that was the response to being a child of the 60s in, the, in, the, in America and looking for direction in my life. I'd started out like Barack Obama as a community organizer, but I realized I hadn't figured out why I had chosen that path instead of another. And so I thought food, if I could just understand why people are hungry, that would unlock the mystery of economics and politics. So I just wanna give you this sense of, if I can practice here. There, there she is. This is me uh, in the 60s saying, huh? Are we, are we really running out of food? Because that's what the newspaper headlines were telling us that we had hit the limits, exactly what we're hearing today, that we've hit the limits of the earth to feed us, and oh, 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 by the way, we're gonna be even worse off uh, because of the growing population. It was a fear message, and I thought, oh, if I could just understand the answer to this, that then that would give my life direction. And since then, however, my uh, questions have continued to grow until ultimately this is the question that has driven, driven my life for the last several decades. It is this, why are we human beings together creating a world that none of us as individuals would choose? And another way you could say, uh, the thesis of my thesis, if you will, is that I strongly believe that we each have to have a working theory about how we got into this mess if we're gonna get out. And so I I'm keep asking why, I wanna know why. Why would this brilliant species choose the reality today? 
think about it. Not anyone gets up in the morning saying, yes, I want to make sure another child dies of hunger. No one anywhere puts that on their to-do list for the day. And yet here we are, okay? Nobody chooses this. We think we not choose this. But look at these numbers. And I just, over the last year, I learned more about that 842 million. That is the latest figure from the United Nations. But it only sank in on into me this year that that number only includes people who have been hungry for more than a year. So if you've, not, if you've gone hungry for months, you don't count. So this is only a very limited number. And I think this third green dot is so important to sink in because it is much, much worse than the official number. One in four of our children are stunted by malnutrition. Now, stunting does not just mean that you're short for your age. No, no, no. It is a medical condition that occurs in the first thousand days of life. And it means cognitive impairment over a lifetime. It means weakened immunity to disease over a lifetime. It means for females, more difficulty in childbearing. So we could say this is not just a condition of children. This is a condition of a quarter of the world's people. So, um, my question, wait, we don't think we are choosing this, so how did this come to be? And over time, I began to ask, what would be powerful enough to have us creating a world that none of us as individuals choose? What could be powerful enough? And I have been helped by many great thinkers, fortunately. And uh, 30 years after there, I was sitting on that driftwood, I read the book by Eric Fromm. Do you know the philosopher Eric Fromm, the German? He needs to be rediscovered. <laughs> he wrote a book in the 70s, I believe, that I only read in the 90s, entitled The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness. And there is a sentence in that that went right to my heart. It is, it is man's humanity that makes him so inhumane. What Eric Fromm was describing is what he then calls frames of orientation, what my daughter and I call the mental map. The mental map is a cultural filter that we absorb unconsciously for the most part in our cultures. It tells us what are the core assumptions about life. It determines literally what we can see and what we cannot see. That is the human condition. As Einstein put it, it is theory which describes, oh, it is theory which defines what we can observe. And so it's like the theory that we absorb, okay? And we're looking for that. I want to tell you a very homey example of how it works. Maybe you can relate. The, one of the biggest, my favorite American holiday is Thanksgiving. It happens next week at home. So everybody gathers for a big meal. We have 35 people coming in the afternoon. So I get up early, excited to make my favorite root vegetable dish. And I know exactly what I'm going to cook it in. It's a big pot, big Dutch oven, we call it. I don't know if the Dutch call it that, but we do. So I run down, look in the cupboards, not there. I look everywhere in the kitchen, nowhere to be found. I go to the basement, it's not there. I'm very frustrated and think somebody must have borrowed it without asking me. I start doing something else. A little bit later, I turn around and there it is. Except it had a plant in it. So it had become a planter. So of course I couldn't see it, even though it's huge, right? And it's red, right? But I couldn't see it because I was looking for a planter I mean, excuse me, I was looking for a Dutch oven to put in the oven. And you don't put planters in the oven. So this is what I mean. And more and more of neuroscience is confirming that we see what we expect to see. So it behooves us, it is super urgent, that we bring to consciousness what is the mental map, the frame that we are absorbing unconsciously? How do we bring it to the surface so that we can, if it is in fact doing us in, which is my thesis, we can remake it. 
evidence-based and experience-based rather than unconsciously absorbed. So the thesis of my life for the time being, <laughs> uh, because I hope I am continuing to change, my thesis is that we are trapped. Well, here, here is the thesis thesis that um, w in, at least at home, the expression is seeing is believing. And so my uh, overarching is that in fact, believing is seeing is the more accurate way of understanding. So our belief system is all important. So here, here it is. I've, I'm positing that in fact, what we are trapped in is a highly unscientific worldview that I got down to three S's. I was so proud of myself because I can actually remember there are three S's. And the three S's are that we are all separate from one another, from nature. We are isolated, egoistic, atomistic, individualistic, and reality is static. There's very little change fundamentally. Human nature is human nature, da 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 da. We are what we are. And the third, of course, is lack, scarcity, lack, meaning lack, lack of everything, lack of not enough energy, not enough food, at home in Boston, not enough parking places, uh, not enough love, you name it. So the way I summarize this concept of lack is not enough goods and not enough goodness because the concept of lack is also that human nature is lacking. That we are, if we, only thing we can really count on is that human beings are selfish, competitive, and materialistic. The rest of the stuff is nice and it shows up, but what we can count on is this very um, narrow piece materialistic, selfish, competitive. Now, if we believe this about ourselves, where does that take us? If we believe this about the nature of reality, that there's not enough and that we're elbowing each other out, somehow I think about that, it's like an image of us all in a big shopping mall where there's not enough goods and we're just out there elbowing each other to get our stuff because there's not enough. It's a very frightening way to think about being in the world. And fear, we know, does not do us well in terms of being um, open and learning and responding to real evidence. In fear, we are reactive. So fundamentally, this mindset uh, is disempowering. Primarily, I'm holding because it starts us on a spiral that is going downward, and it begins with distrust, distrust of self, and therefore distrust of our neighbors, and therefore it's impossible to believe that we can actually participate together and come up with common decisions for common well-being. So I call it then the scarcity mind, not enough goods or goodness, begins this downward spiral where we believe that we are incapable and we look for others, whether it's the, the strong man dictator or whether it's the strong <laughs> market system. We were told in the 1980s by Ronald Reagan that the market was magic. He called it the magic of the marketplace. If we just privatize, privatize, we are incapable, but there is an infallible force. If we keep human hands out of it, there is an infallible force. It's called the market that will sort it all out for us, and we will all gain. Now. The problem is, of course, markets have been around for as long as we've been in community, but we've fallen for this peculiar notion of a market, driven by one rule, highest return to existing wealth. So wealth accrues to wealth accrues to wealth until we reach such level of concentration. Today, in the US, the concentration of wealth is worse than Egypt, for example. Worldwide, we have half the world's people surviving on about 3% of the world's income. So wealth accrues to wealth until it is so concentrated that it infects and distorts and controls our public decision making, what we still unfortunately call democracy, even if it's in name alone. In 1938, the President of the United States, who was referred to in the introduction, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, warned us, warned us, 
in a joint session to Congress that year in 1938, he said, the liberty of democracy is not safe if a people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. But this starting with distrust of self, we turn over our fate to a marketplace that is, by definition, uh, concentrating power that then is so strong that we have today, last election, $10 billion. The latest report I heard, $10 billion influencing our last presidential election. So where does that take us then, this scarcity mind? It means that, as I say, um, we end up with um, hunger no matter how much is produced. We think of the world's two, the biggest and the, the oldest democracies. The world's biggest democracy is what, India? Half of the people there are, are uh, half of the children are stunted by malnutrition. And I just explained how devastating that is. And the world's oldest democracy, the US, I've explained uh, something of our reality there in terms of politics. But did you know that even in the United States, this wealthy country, one half of American children will depend on public aid at some point in their childhood for food, which comes to a little bit more than a dollar per meal, very meager rations. So I'm suggesting then that this, we end up with democracy in name only. And so this concept or this uh, mindset of scarcity ends up creating a social model that fails because not just is it mal aligned, but it is perversely aligned with nature and with human nature. And what I mean by that, it is perversely aligned because in two ways I suggest that it fails to meet, it cannot meet, it denies the most basic of human needs besides the physical. It denies the physical for so many, but it denies connection with one another a sense of meaning and purpose other than just survival, making money, and efficacy, having a voice. We feel powerless. We just um, um, feel that we have no control over our futures. So it denies it our deepest needs. And I think that, of course, I can't prove this, but I believe this denial coming directly from the scarcity mind is one reason that suicide is a global pandemic. Suicide has increased dr dramatically in, uh, in the last 50 years, so much that today, the more people die uh, from suicide than from homicide or war in the world today. And I think it is in large measure, not just the physical suffering, but that our, our deepest need for meaning, connection, and efficacy or power is denied. So, Another way of thinking about why uh, this um, scarcity mind leads to a social model that is perversely aligned with our nature is that it leads inevitably then to the three conditions I posit that have proven throughout history and have proven when we have been put in the lab, we human beings have been put through experiments about what is our nature. There are at least three conditions I think that can be argued almost inevitably bring out the very worst in our species. That is the extreme concentration of power, whether it be bullying on the playground where one kid, you know, uh, just lords it over all the other children, or whether it's all, to the all the way to the extreme of genocide. That extreme concentration of power does not end up in good things. Lack of transparency, that is secrecy. Just think about what happened on Wall Street, for example. During that whole period of these risky derivatives that were being invented and then sold as, as good investments on Wall Street, do you know one of the slogans was IBG, YBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. Meaning that we'll be out of there, we won't be caught. So secrecy, another feature of that that emerges out of the scarcity mind and this spiral of powerlessness. And third, the blame game, of which 
Progressives are also guilty. Oh, it's, it's, it's the problem is those bad people. The problem is, it's not me, it's, it's those other people. So cultures of blame, those are the three conditions, I think, that flow from the scarcity mind in my understanding of how uh, we are operating today in so many countries, certainly in mine, um, that ends up actually creating the conditions that have proven to bring out the very worst in our species. So remember I was asking, how could it be that we're creating a world that none of us as individuals would choose? So it's something about, I'm grasping for, something about this mental map that allows us to tolerate these conditions. Now the question, can we break free? Can we break free? And here is the truth that I love uh, also to share with you. My favorite word in the English language now is neo uh, uh, neuroplasticity. <laughs> it means that we actually, our brains are being formed moment to moment, that we actually create new neural pathways. I think of them as stream beds of the mind. As we, new experiences and new ideas come into our minds, uh, we actually can remake, remake our mental map. We can. So we can spring free, but sometimes it takes a jolt. And this is why I loved what was said earlier about crises can be opportunity. Uh, we've, some cultures have recognized that. And I call it moments of dissonance, moments of dissonance. And boy, are we in a number of them right now. So I will just uh, suggest that those moments of dissonance are happening, that are rattling our cage, so to speak, and shaking up our our mental map that we've absorbed. And I'll just run through very quickly here um, some things, for example, this hunger. Yes, we've had hunger, 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 but we're realizing it's hunger amid plenty. Just look at these figures here and you'll see this is particularly dramatic for me because when I was sitting on that driftwood in the late 60s, <laughs> uh, since then, 40% more food supply for every single person on earth and yet still one in four of our children stunted. So that is certainly a moment of dissonance. And all that food, that's just on the leftovers. That's just what's left over after massive feeding of grain to animals and now into the production of uh, agrofuel, et cetera, and waste, of course. Now, hunger still doesn't affect the majority of us, certainly in the industrial countries. However, another piece of this affects all of us now, that food that's always been our source of nourishment, our source of comfort, our source of joy, our source of connection with the earth and each other. What is happening? Food is becoming a threat. Food is making us sick. This surely is dissonance making, is, is very dramatic. And again, I'll let you look at those numbers. I'll, I'll just add, though, very personal experience. I was just um, um, in touch with a doctor in a very poor area of rural India. And he told me in his clinic of 2,000 people, their calories are fine. They get enough calories. 60% of these Indians below the poverty line for India, 60% of them are diabetic and have hypertension and related diseases. And so this is very shocking that calories are not calories. <laughs> calories don't necessarily mean nourishment anymore. And the other point of dissonance that I think is really disturbing when people realize, and my daughter wrote a book entitled Diet for a Hot Planet about the connection between food and climate change. And the new studies by a very respected research center suggest that half or more of the entire climate change challenge is because of our destructive food system, including, as you know, the burning of rainforest, uh, to grow feed, for example, or palm oil. So this is quite um, a time of mental dissonance. Um, and I would then like to suggest that, um, that um, as we are registering what is not working, this failing mental map, 
What is emerging is what I call the eco-mind, exactly the opposite assumption from the scarcity mind. But I want to build up to that by telling you very specific examples that I think represent the exact opposite of the scarcity mind and begin to remake our mental map. And that's why I think sharing them is so important. And I think food, while it is a source of great disease now and climate uh, change, it's a part of the climate problem, it is also part of the pathway uh, to these new way of thinking. And I think that my youthful intuition was correct, that food has particular power to help us create a new mindset. Because it is connected, this is, it's very emotional, it connects us to our bodies, to each other, to our ancestors and ritual and culture. Uh, to the earth itself, and that is tremendous power to wake us up. And so quickly I want to do a very uh, speedy tour here of aspects of a movement that I like to feel that I'm part of, democratizing, humanizing, energizing uh, our connection to food, and um, I will, certainly there's a community food aspect of this that has been mentioned by Jessica and, and others uh, about um, such things as farmers markets. There are now 18,000 in the US um, and community supported agriculture. But I wanna focus in my short time on the food sovereignty movement and the right to food movement. Um, I want to take us, um, for example, I want to take us to India where exactly a year ago I got to go meet the women that had become my heroes, that had become to embody everything that I'm talking about in terms of letting go of the scarcity mind and entering the eco-mind of connection and um, empowerment. These are women of the Deccan Development Society who 20 years ago were living, they were like the people who were, you know, who were diabetic and, and, and diseased by bad food and worse than that they said it wasn't just the pesticide it wasn't just the white rice diet that was hurting them it was the social relations they were beaten by their husbands humiliated by the landlord they had no sense of control over their lives and they then 20 years ago started coming together as groups in their villages. These women meet every week at nine o'clock at night and begin, began to reorganize their relationship to the land and to one another. They got a small loan that enabled them to have a bullock to help um, uh, work the land that, that they thought was unworkable, but with learning, with organic methods, agro ecological farming, they were able to grow in the, in the plot I walked in of one acre, they had 20 different crops growing. Uh, all that they needed from greens to oil seeds to a dozen uh, types of millet, which are much more nutritious than rice, and, uh, and the pulses that provide the protein. So they were then in this, uh, they then, this, this uh, motion, they were making a pledge to one another. They pledged not to use chemicals in their farming. They pledged not to use genetically modified seeds. And the third pledge, I will share what I am learning. I will share my seeds and I will share my knowledge. And so every year they have a caravan. Uh, there are now 75 villages that are part of this movement and they have a caravan that goes village to village. It's a beautiful painted caravan with dancing and singing and all sorts of music to accompany it. And they share what they're learning with other villages. They petitioned the government. They waited five years and finally got their own radio station so they can share what they're learning. And one woman said to me, it's like when I come home from the field, it's like talking to my sister because in India the women and leave their families and go to their husband's uh, home in often a different village. And so it, to hear the woman's voice on the radio as she said, like talking to her sister. And they learn and share their hygiene uh, knowledge, their planting knowledge. They have their own cooperative marketing now. And their, their voice, this is to the, to the remaking of our whole concept of democracy, is that they are now finding their voice at a national level 
uh, working to convince the, the government, the state government, first of all, of Andhra Pradesh, this is Andhra Pradesh in southern India, to actually uh, procure some of this nutritious millet as part of their public distribution system instead of just the lacking the white rice that is so lacking in nutrition. They are, they are petitioning uh, the government to uh, buy the millets from farmers like these, these organic farmers. So the uh, Deccan Development Society is also part of a movement called the Alliance for, um, the Alliance for Democratizing Agricultural Research in South Asia that then takes us quickly to another part. Oh, there they are, smiling, yes. I had to throw that in because their faces are so so beaming with pride of what they've accomplished. And they then are part of this democratization of agricultural research movement that's going on throughout the global south. And here, farmers in Mali are part of a citizen's jury where they are choosing uh, to reject genetically modified seeds and demand a role in the direction of agricultural research. I want quickly to take us uh, to another part of Africa, because if you haven't followed this story, it is phenomenal. Again, about 20 years ago, this was virtual desert. It was very, very hard packed. Very little could grow. And through the learning of agroecological practices, agroforestry has transformed. Look at this number, um, 12 and a half million acres of land. Uh, and Farmers began, again, to trust their own knowledge because before they had felt dependent on the, or uh, vulnerable to, I should say, the French colonial government who owned the trees and that policy changed so that they re-nourished these, re-greened, they call it, re-greening uh, allowed the trees to grow, which held the soil in place, provided nitrogen so they didn't need chemical fertilizers, and the trees provide fruits and fodder as well. And this is extraordinary achievement of 12 and a half million acres. Um, from there, I'd like to take us to another part of food sovereignty, which is control of the land itself. Brazil, the landless workers movement there. This is the encampment that my daughter took that photograph as well. The beginning uh, in Brazil after the dictator um, uh, in the early 80s, the constitution was rewritten so that it is required that land serve a social purpose. But so much land in, in uh, Brazil is held by a few, uh, a minority, and not used. And so the landless workers movement settles, this is an encampment, uh, illegal. They move in, in the dark of night, and then they begin to petition through the legal channels to gain title to this land. And you will see two elected leaders. You see they have gender balance in their democratic process in their village, in their communities. Uh, they've created um, uh, 3,000 new communities and settled about 300,000 people. These are the two representatives in the settlement that we visited. So that is something of a taste of what is emerging that is breaking free from the scarcity mind and creating new relationships that um, actually embody the opposite of the conditions that bring out the worst. I want to stay in Brazil for just a moment and talk about the, the third on that list of food movements is the right to food. 23 constitutions now um, require food to be, uh, specify that food, healthy food is a right of citizenship. Brazil has taken it further than most places and I was fortunate to visit a city of one of the biggest cities in, um, in Brazil. This is taken in Belo Horizonte 2.5 million people live here. In 1993, a um, mayor was elected on the right to food platform. And he said, if you're a citizen and you're hungry, you're still account I'm still accountable to you. I've got to make the market work for you. So the idea was not get rid of the market, but make the market honest. Put values around the market so that everyone can eat. An example, they brought, first of all, a very democratic process. They brought together a council of people in a number of different aspects of society, um, including the church community, the business community, the, the health institutions, etc. And they came up with so many ideas. And one uh, is straight from the countryside where they give, um, they um, 
provide small farmers with a plot of land. Um, but since there's no middleman in between taking a big cut of, <laughs> of the profit, uh, they can keep the price of this produce in reach of the poorest people in the community. They also, instead of soup kitchens where food is given away, they created these open air popular restaurants um, where there is no testing of are you poor enough to eat here? No, everyone is welcome and a whole cross section of people are able to access really wonderful meals. For lunch, it's 45 cents. Um, now, here's the punchline. This is, again, a very large city in Brazil, 2.5 million people who took the road of food as a human right. And look what they have accomplished. I think this may be historic speed of social change. In 12 years, they reduced the death rate of children under five by 73%. And this was so dramatic, and I was able to talk to the person who was a coordinator of many of these initiatives, and I'll never forget when she was speaking, and she said, yes, I, I knew how much hunger there was in our community. I know how much hunger there is in our world. She said, but what upsets me so is how easy it is to end it. And of course, she wasn't saying that her work was easy. She was saying that we can do this, we can do this. Very common sense approaches, and they got that kind of result. So I um, would like to then try to end quickly <laughs> by um, suggesting going back to my opening frame, um, and that is that all of these stories, and I have so many more I'd like to share, but all of them to me represent what? that we are moving from this destructive, failing presumption. And it's still, it's, it's, you know, I just get so upset every day almost at home. I'm hearing messages of scarcity. Oh, there's not enough food. And oh, with climate change, there certainly won't be enough. Letting go of this fear premise to what is now understood by biologists and physicists and everyone studying the nature of reality is that we are all connected. At a subatomic level, we are all connected. As Hans-Peter Durer, who's already been quoted, but my favorite Hans-Peter Durer um, uh, line is, yes, he said, Frankie, in biological systems, there are no parts, there are only participants. So if we're only participants, then, and, and everything is in continuous change, continuous change, then what? We are all, each one of us, co-creators moment to moment. So the only choice we do not have is whether to change the world. Because even our inaction, our just going along, we are changing the world. Others are watching us and saying, oh, I might as well give up too. No matter what we do, we're changing the world. The only choice we have is how we change it. So. By this understanding, we are all co-creators. And in this, then, we can begin to create, uh, move from this scary idea of hitting the limits to the notion of alignment. Align with our own nature and with wider nature. And what does it mean to align with our own nature? Like any organism in ecology, we know what brings out the best in this organism. The continuous dispersion of power transparency in human relationships, and mutual accountability. Stop the blame game and step up ourselves. So we know what to do. We can start consciously creating the conditions that bring out the best, making possible uh, then to tap these very deep, now documented through neuroscience and uh, new understanding from our own anthropological uh, history, that Deep in us are these qualities to be, to be tapped, to be pulled out of us. In other words, empathy. It turns out that there are neurons in our brains now, We've, we now know, called mirror neurons. And we, more than other primates, it means that am I, as I'm standing here going like this, actually, <laughs> there are neurons in your brains firing as if you're going like this. 
So we can't, we, we absorb one another. What power that is, right? Think about the power. Because everybody is watching everybody. And therefore, we, we have power in terms of, of uh, what we model in our lives, but we also have the power to choose what comes into our consciousness. Choose the stories we pay attention to. Choose the people who we uh, relate to, and we will become more like them. So this empathetic quality of us gives us incredible power. And so we are able then to let go of this distrust of self and begin to believe that it is possible that we have exactly what's needed to create those three conditions of dispersion of power, transparency, and mutual accountability. And what I love to call living democracy grows out of that. Living democracy in which it is not simply <laughs> markets plus elections. We drop that thin, dead idea of democracy. And we think of democracy as something we actively do. It is a culture that embodies these qualities, that pulls from us the very best in us and keeps the worst in check because we are also admitting that not a few of us, but almost all of us will behave brutally in the wrong conditions. So we accept the ecological view that the context for every species is what is so important. And then we get busy focusing, and I'm just about to wrap up here, very personal, it gets very personal. And I'll just offer this. For me, I like to think that human beings are, most of us, are good enough. That we don't need a change in the human heart. We don't. We are soft wired in this to be cooperative. We love it. In fact, when the neuroscientists look at our brain, they discover that cooperating is so pleasurable, it's right up there with eating chocolate. That's how wired we are to enjoy cooperation. So we're good enough. But, in fact, that those qualities, as I argue, only come out under certain conditions. So we've got to be bold to build those conditions. Now, here's the trickiest part of all, that we aren't atomistic individuals. We are so socially connected that it is hard to break from the pack. It is hard to be different. That's how socially bonded we are. But when the whole pack is heading over Victoria Falls, that's how I like to think of it, we better paddle in another direction. We better say, no, 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 or maybe jump out of the boat and swim to shore and say, hey, there's another way to go. But it's scary to be different and to say the unpopular and to stand as Juan has done against a whole mindset that dams are good and development is going. It, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. And so we got to work on uh, what Gisigo called civil courage, a term I learned in Germany. But I call my, it's bold humility. The bold part is rethinking fear. As you heard my, my metaphor of rethinking fear as pure energy so that when my heart beats wildly because it does when I get scared, then I try to th remember, okay, that's just my inner applause going off, saying keep going, keep going. So. Uh, we have to rethink fear not as something to stop us. It's just another source of energy. That is what I was taught by a friend of Wangari Mathai who actually was almost murdered by his assailants for criticizing the dictator. And he began to give away his gifts, his gifts of his favorite Bible to his attackers, Reverend Timothy Ninjoya. And when he told me the story, I said, Reverend Najoya, how can that be? How can you be magnanimous in the face of, of murderous attack? And he said, you don't understand. Fear is not out there. It's, 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 um, it's something that we can, we can work with. We can transform fear. It's in us. We can turn it into retribution or, or, or into energy, into love. It's up to us. So this is a rethinking of fear is required, a rethinking of power, not as something over us, but simply our capacity to act, and our power is in our connection, as, as I say. You know, if we're all connected and things are changing moment to moment, then we have much more power than we ever thought we did to co-create. And in that way, we can choose uh, to bring into our lives people who are more powerful, 
in that sense of brave and courageous than we are. And we know we'll become more like them. Because <laughs> that's what human beings do. We're shaped by our context. And so that is the woman I carry with me as my lodestar of courage. She passed away two years ago, but I feel like she's more with me today than she's ever been. As you've heard, she planted a few trees on Earth Day, and I will just take that story a bit further. You heard that by the time that she got the Nobel Prize, and by the time she passed away two years ago, that 45 million trees, now 50 million in her country, can be attributed to the movement she started. She had to withstand beatings and jailings and humiliation, and she just kept walking. Although, when I asked her about that, she said, yeah, you have to keep walking. But sometimes you have to jump, she said. <laughs> so, but guess what? After she got the Nobel Peace Prize, she, um, she was contacted by the UN Environmental Program, and they came up with the program Plant for the Planet of planting trees all over the world. A billion a year was their goal. And I heard that, that was in 07, and I thought, oh, that's way too ambitious. I hope they're not gonna be too disappointed. You know where we are now with that program? 12 billion trees. So uh, that was, you know, it should have been eight by that one billion, 12 billion trees. So think about it, right? A few trees on Earth Day in 1977, you could say 12 billion now. <laughs> so what I mean by this is that this is the, the key of um, keeping the energy flowing <laughs> through us for me is this simple observation that in an eco-mind understanding of continuous change, connection, and co-creation, then it is not possible to know what's possible. So I don't call myself a pessimist or an optimist. I call myself a possibilist. It is not possible to know what's possible. And if that's true, I feel completely free to go for the world I want. Thank you so much.